back in Japan. When I came in November and I went back home to Nigeria, I told everyone that in coming to Japan, I felt that I'd come home. And that indeed, you know, the Japanese would have looked at me and seen a foreigner, but I felt so at home in Japan. I felt that I was Japanese. <laughs> and it reminded me of um, this Arab um, astronaut. He's from Saudi Arabia, and he was an astronaut. And he said when he went into outer space, he looked back on the planet Earth, and he saw a great blue ball. There were no borders. There was nothing to tell him that this is Saudi Arabia, your country, in contrast to everywhere else. It was, he, he then realized that he was an earthling, not a Saudi Arabian. And in many ways, we will come to a time that we realize that we're earthlings. We're not Nigerian, Japanese, American, or any place else. We're just citizens of the planet Earth. And I think that day will come soon. But really, I wasn't even feeling so much like an earthling as I was feeling Japanese. And this is a sincere feeling because in many ways in Nigeria, I'm very introverted and I'm quiet. And I find Nigeria kind of can be so overwhelming. But Japan is made of introverts. It's a country of introverts. I just felt completely at home. and. If not for the fact that I think it would be near impossible to be looking for citizenship in Japan, I would try. But really, I think it would be hard to make that, um, br to bridge that um, big divide between my color of my skin, my hair, and all of the, you know. But they don't realize when they look at me that very, I very much identify. And I want to honor the Sionji family for hosting all of us for, um, guiding this process in a very intuitive way and being guided by spirit in this process. I want to honor Mr. Sayonji for having a wife that is so deeply rooted in spirit and fire and being able to create a safe container for your spouse. May Allah bless you and reward you. You know, really, you cannot imagine how moving it has been for me to watch how you've always supported your wife. And if you understand that women in the world are struggling to come out, and most women do not find that kind of support, um, it would be really good for other men to watch you and to model you. I have now seven minutes, so I'm going to go to my letter. And in the letter, I want to also reflect also on what we've been saying here. So, dear earthlings of the future, by now, you've arrived into a planet that my generation compromised. In just the last decade, researchers have found, in just the last 10 years, researchers have found that humans have added 800 million people to the Earth emitted 335 billion tons of carbon dioxide and extirpated 750,000 species of life, destroyed 750,000 species of life. You will be wondering how we could have done so much damage so quickly. The truth is we wielded more power than ever and the power outstripped our common sense. We've been like a fetus, unaware of its growing body and how that body connects to its mother's, unaware that it depends on its mother for food and protection. Human beings forgot how we are connected to Mother Earth and how we are dependent on it for everything. Or more accurately, we forgot what we used to know in the mad rush for power and for wealth. Now, paraphrasing the sacred Hindu text, the Bhagavad Gita, we have become death, the destroyer of worlds. Today, as scientists the world over cry out about the unprecedented destruction of life on Earth, we are slowly being forced to awaken 
and face the nightmare we have wrought? What will be our creed as we seek to turn away from the destructive road we have been traveling? In my life, I am guided by three lessons. The first one, our wounds are our gifts. Our biggest wounds are our greatest teachings, our greatest source of learning. And for human beings, we hold on to these wounds and we show the world, this is me, I'm the one that was attacked in this way, I'm the one that was exploited in this way, I'm the one that was violated in that way. And by so doing, we're showing that we're resisting what was done to us, but we're also trying to shame the person that did it to us. If our wound is our source of light, then we can at least be generous also to the person that caused us to learn this lesson because without that injury, there would have been no learning. And if we believe ourselves to be spiritual beings that are all interconnected, deeply connected, then we should know that the injury that was done to us, the person also did to himself. And there's no now no need to add on to that injury by bringing anger, vengeance, and all kinds of negative energy. Why can we not receive the gift of the lesson and use it collectively to move all of humanity forward? Can we learn to do this? Because in many ways, we spend so much time fighting each other that we can't receive the lesson and use it for our own progress collectively. This we have to change if we want to move forward. My second lesson that I learned is that we need to become balanced to have a harmonious world. Today, we have women and men all over the planet. But do we have more men or more women on the planet? Do you know? More women? More, who else? More men, more women? More male, more females? More women? More women? We have 66 million more men, more males on the planet Earth today. That's the size of the country of France. We have 66 million more men on the planet Earth. We've had, we've had more men on the planet Earth for 50 years. The last time we had equal number of men and women was 1960. For over 50 years, we've had more men on the planet, and today it's 66 million more men. And it is because we do not value women, and in many societies in the world, they're consciously choosing not to have baby girls. Let us let that sink in. And in the parts of the world that has the highest gap between men and women is also the parts of the world where we have the highest conflict because there are not enough women for the men. So we have to bring the world back into balance. And we have to bring the world into harmony by bringing the world into balance. And I think, you know, I know that um, Dr. Um, Izumi Masukawa is going to be bringing a lady from South Africa who will talk about white lionesses and white lions. And I want to share the, with you the story of lionesses because it's very much like the work of Mrs. Sayonji. When I came in November, Mrs. Sayonji gathered the women that she works with to have a meeting with me. And they reminded me of the white lionesses. White lionesses come together and then they emit a chemical um, in their body, a smell that signals to the other that I'm here for you, I belong to you. They signal to each other that they belong to the other. Then they start grooming each other. They start taking care of each other. They, they take care of their hair. They take care of everything. And in the end, they start to look the same. And it's this way that they build the strength of the pride because those women, those, um, women lions are powerful. They're strong. It was the same way. 
how your women gathered and you celebrated each other. Before any of the women would speak, Mrs. Sayonji would quickly say something so that me, being a foreigner, an outsider, not from Japan, would know the quality of the woman speaking. It is how I know this lady here and all the other women that I've seen here that are in a circle. She introduced them and explained the great achievements that they've made. It was as if she was grooming them. Many women do not do this because we feel that there's not enough space for women. In fact, sometimes you find women fighting each other. We have to learn to groom each other. We have to take lessons from the lionesses. If we want the world to, re, um, to w value women, we need to value each other and value women and then let the world come back into harmony. The last area, and I've run out of time and I don't want to abuse my time, is, is the, the issue of um, the legacy for future generations. There was a journalist that went to an African village and he wanted um, the children to run to a tree that was a little bit like maybe where that light is, the distance from where I'm sitting to where that light is there at, that, at the wall. And he, um, he said he would give them bananas, whoever won. So the children looked at each other. Then they held hands and walked to the tree. So then the journalist said, but why did you walk to the tree? Now you will have to share the bananas. And the children said, if one of us won, the others would have been sad. Now we're all happy. They all won. And I think we have to come to this point as humanity to understand that we will either not win or we will win together. I was just in the United States where um, President Carter called a meeting on Monday. So I was at the meeting in Atlanta. And at the, at the meeting, President Carter said, our oh, America is great. And I said, yes, America is great, and yet it is too small. Because we don't need one great country. We need a world of all, all of us rising to greatness. And that is where we need to get to as humanity. And that's where I want us to get to through the work that, and the legacy we will leave for the future. It's a legacy of love. Love can be shared. It never is it's never reduced in being shared. It only multiplies in being shared. So let us leave that legacy for those that will come in the future. My prayer to our children, their children, and the descendants that will come in the future is that the, by the time they read my letter, you will find that we grew up quickly enough to leave you a world fit for you to live in. Amen. Thank you. <laughs>